Herzlich willkommen. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde. Ich äh, freue mich sehr über diese große Resonanz für unsere Konferenz Energiewende Europäisch Denken hier in der Heinrich-Boll-Stiftung. Das ist nicht das erste Mal, dass wir über europäische Energiepolitik hier diskutieren. Wir haben schon vor Jahren ein Projekt gestartet, das einige von Ihnen vielleicht äh, kennen. Es gibt es auch als äh, schriftliche Studie. Irene, äh, die Idee, das Konzept einer europäischen Gemeinschaft für erneuerbare Energien, haben das äh, Projekt inzwischen auch weiterentwickelt. Michaele Schreier, die frühere Haushaltskommissarin der Europäischen Union, ist Co-Autorin der Studie hier auch auf der Konferenz. Können Sie auch gerne dazu befragen in den Pausen. Für uns war eigentlich das keine Frage, dass die Energiewende in Deutschland eingebettet werden muss in ein europäisches Konzept, in einen europäischen Verbund und zwar nicht nur physisch, was äh, den Ausbau des europäischen Stromleitungsnetzes äh, betrifft und die weiträumige Integration von Windenergie aus den europäischen Küstenregionen mit Solarenergie aus dem Sonnengürtel rund um das Mittelmeer, mit Wasserkraft aus Skandinavien und den Alpen, vielleicht auch mit Geothermie, mit Erdwärme aus Südosteuropa, wo die geologischen Vorkommen besonders günstig sind. Also ein gesamteuropäischer Energienverbund, der einerseits die Kostenvorteile unterschiedlicher Standortqualitäten nutzt, gleichzeitig die Versorgungssicherheit und die Netzstabilität durch eine solche großräumige Integration verbessert, damit auch die Wettbewerbsfähigkeit der erneuerbaren Energien im europäischen Maßstab voranbringt, Economies of Scale besser nutzt als das alleine im nationalen in der nationalen Dimension möglich ist, aber gleichzeitig ging es auch um ein europapolitisches Projekt in einer Zeit, in der die europäische Integration in der Krise ist, brauchen wir eigentlich dringend einige positive Projekte, gesamteuropäische Projekte, die den Mehrwert europäischer Kooperation und Integration unmittelbar demonstrieren und die auch eine neue Begeisterung, eine neue Aufbruchstimmung äh, schaffen für europäische Integration und dazu gehört für uns diese Idee einer europäischen Gemeinschaft für erneuerbare Energien, Europa als Vorreiter der globalen Energiewende, als Kernprojekt, nicht nur der politischen Integration Europas, sondern auch der industriellen Erneuerung Europas. Und das ist eine Frage, die angesichts der europäischen Finanz- und Wirtschaftskrise die dramatische soziale Dimension äh, in den Krisenländern angenommen hat, äh, von einer großen Dringlichkeit. Wir brauchen auch eine neue industriepolitische Vision für Europa, und der Umbau unseres Energiesystems auf der Basis erneuerbarer Energien mit allem, was an intelligenter Technologie dazugehört, Speichertechnologie, Netztechnologien, Steuerungstechniken, das ist für uns eben nicht nur ein ökologisches Zukunftsprojekt, sondern es ist auch ein großes wirtschaftliches Pionierprojekt, das Europa neue ökonomische Perspektiven und vor allem unseren jungen Leuten auch die Aussicht auf nachhaltige, interessante, sinnvolle Jobs und Einkommen eröffnen kann. 
Die Tagung hat also sehr wohl einen, eine lange Vorgeschichte und einen, einen großen politischen Kontext, in die sie eingebettet ist. Sie ist aber gleichzeitig hochaktuell, weil mittlerweile die Friktionen, die sich abzeichnen zwischen der Energiewende in der Bundesrepublik und zumindest einigen unserer Nachbarländern ja unübersehbar sind. Es ist ja nicht nur so, dass wir die Vorteile einer stärkeren energiepolitischen Integration in Europa nicht nutzen, sondern wir stoßen auch zunehmend an Konflikte. Einige unserer Nachbarn, soll ich sagen, drohen, kündigen an, dass sie ihre Netze für Überschussstrom aus der Bundesrepublik sperren wollen. Obwohl das zumindest für die Kunden, für die Stromkunden in diesen Ländern ja durchaus Vorteile mit sich bringt, wenn die Bundesrepublik sogar zu negativen Preisen Strom in ihre Nachbarländern exportiert, also noch zusätzlich zu dem Strom Geld obendrauf legt, um ihn exportieren zu können. Aber natürlich gibt es in diesen Ländern auch massive energiewirtschaftliche Interessen, vor allem der Elektrizitätsunternehmen, die äh, mit Kohlekraftwerken, zum Teil mit Braunkohlekraftwerken arbeiten, äh, für die das eine unliebsame Konkurrenz darstellt und ihr Geschäftsmodell in Frage stellt. Wie auch immer, wir brauchen dringend eine stärkere politische und technische Koordination zwischen der Bundesrepublik und ihren Nachbarn, mit einigen Nachbarn, die sich ja selbst bereits längst auf den Weg hin zu erneuerbaren Energien gemacht haben, ist das Potenzial auch groß. Vorreiterstaaten wie Dänemark oder die anderen skandinavischen Länder oder Österreich, äh, mit denen wir eine gemeinsame äh, sagen, Richtung teilen, während es mit anderen Staaten ja durchaus großen Diskussionsbedarf gibt, um es diplomatisch auszudrücken, was die Zukunft europäischer Energiepolitik betrifft. Atomkraft ist für einige Staaten immer noch ein Thema und auch die Zukunft der Kohle wird ja durchaus kontrovers sagen, diskutiert. Das wird alles auf den Tisch kommen, wenn jetzt darüber verhandelt wird, wie die erneuerbare Energienpolitik der EU nach 2020 ausgestaltet werden soll. Und wir verstehen uns als, sagen Böll Stiftung, als einen zivilgesellschaftlichen Akteur, der versucht im Vorfeld dieser europäischen Entscheidungen und strategischen Orientierungen, die jetzt anstehen, einen Dialog einen wirklich europäischen Dialog über die Zukunft der europäischen Energiepolitik zu organisieren, aber auch einen Dialog zwischen unterschiedlichen Milieus, Energiewirtschaft, Umweltinitiativen, Wissenschaft und politische Akteure sowohl der europäischen wie der nationalen Ebene. Das wird sich auch in dieser Konferenz widerspiegeln. Wir haben Referentinnen und Experten aus der Bundesrepublik, aus den europäischen Institutionen, aus Polen, Frankreich, der Tschechischen Republik, aus Dänemark, den Niederlanden, der Schweiz, aus Spanien und Großbritannien hier vertreten. Und ich möchte unsere Gäste aus den anderen europäischen Ländern hier ganz besonders herzlich willkommen heißen. Es geht also nicht nur um eine Diskussion über Europa, sondern um einen wirklichen Austausch äh, unter Europäerinnen unterschiedlicher nationaler Herkunft. Genau. Ich möchte mich, ich möchte mich zum Ende ganz herzlich bei meinen Kolleginnen und Kollegen bedanken, die diese Konferenz aus der Taufe gehoben haben, die sie inhaltlich und organisatorisch vorbereitet haben, insbesondere bei Nora Löhle, unserer Ökologiereferentin. Das war wirklich dein, früher hätte man gesagt, Gesellinnenstück. Ganz herzlichen Dank dafür. 
aber auch bei unserem Europareferat ähm, und bei Melanie Sorge und ihren Kolleginnen, die als externe Konferenzmanager äh, sich um diese Tagung verdient gemacht haben. Und last not least bei unserem Tagungsbüro und der Technik, die für einen hoffentlich reibungslosen Ablauf äh, heute und morgen sorgen werden. Jetzt freue ich mich sehr, Rainer Barke hier begrüßen zu können, der die, wie sagt man, Neudeutsch Keynote halten wird, das Einleitungsreferat, den Einleitungsvortrag. Rainer Barke ist gegenwärtig beruflich Direktor der Agora Energiewende, der größten und wohl wichtigsten zivilgesellschaftlichen Plattform zur konzeptionellen Begleitung der Energiewende. Ich darf vielleicht sagen, dass äh, diese Initiative vieles an Aufgaben wahrnimmt, die man eigentlich von der Regierung äh, erwarten könnte, die sie aber nicht wahrnimmt, sowohl was äh, konzeptionelle Studien angeht, aber auch die große Herausforderung einer Koordination unter den unterschiedlichen Akteuren, die an der Energiewende beteiligt sind. Rainer Barke ist einer der wichtigsten Architekten der Energiewende und des Atomausstiegs in der Bundesrepublik in den Zeiten der rot-grünen Koalition. Das erneuerbare Energiengesetz aus dem Jahr 2000 wurde in unserem Eingangsfilm schon kurz vorgestellt, kurz und gut. Er ist einer der besten Köpfe, die man zu diesem Thema überhaupt bekommen kann. Ich bedanke mich für Ihr Interesse und möchte gerne Rainer Barke zum Mikrofon bitten. Dankeschön. Ja, vielen Dank, Ralf. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, guten Tag. Ein ganz besonderes, herzliches Willkommen an die Gäste aus den europäischen Nachbarländern. Da ich gehört habe, dass wir simultane Übersetzung haben, spreche ich jetzt erst einmal in Deutsch und dann später in der Diskussion gehen wir dann ins Englische über. Ich habe aus meinen Besuchen in den Nachbarländern gelernt, dass es wichtig ist, dass man am Anfang betont, dass diese Energiewende in Deutschland nicht vor zwei Jahren vom Himmel gefallen ist, keine spontane plötzliche politische Überreaktion gewesen ist, sondern dass diese Energiewende im Kern schon seit 2000 läuft, das heißt vor 13 Jahren beschlossen worden ist. Die damalige Regierung hat entschieden mit Mehrheit und der starken Ablehnung durch die Opposition aus der Kernenergie in Deutschland bis ungefähr 2022 auszusteigen die erneuerbaren Energien zu fördern über das erneuerbaren Energiengesetz, kraft wärme zu fördern. Später kam dann hinzu der europäische Emissionshandel und dann hier auch national die Trennung von Erzeugung und Netzbetrieb, die Regulierung der Netze, damit es für alle einen diskriminierungsfreien Zugang gibt. Diese Elemente der Energiewende sind von den Nachfolgerregierungen im Kern eigentlich weitergeführt worden, teilweise weiterentwickelt worden, mit einer Ausnahme. Kernenergie war immer ein zentraler Streitpunkt und die Regierungskoalition, die die Bundestagswahl 2009 gewonnen hat, hat dann Ende 2010 beschlossen, die Laufzeit der verbleibenden Kernkraftwerke in Deutschland bis ungefähr 2040 und danach zu verlängern. Diese Entscheidung war aber nur für wenige Wochen gültig. Dann passierte Fukushima und da diese Laufzeitverlängerung alles andere als populär war in Deutschland, sah sich dann die Regierung auch veranlasst, hier zu einer Kehrtwende zu kommen. Und für einige ist das der Beginn der Energiewende, für mich ist es mehr das Jahr 2000. Das ist dann vielleicht auch Geschmackssache. Diese Entscheidung vom Juni 2011 war in meinen Augen in der Tat allerdings eine historische. 
Das war eine historische, weil wir nach Jahrzehnten von streitiger Energiediskussion jetzt einen großen, breiten nationalen Konsens haben in diesem Land. Sowohl die Regierungsparteien als auch der größte Teil, der weitaus größte Teil der Oppositionsparteien hat diesen Beschluss mitgetragen und er war auch deshalb historisch, weil er weit in die Zukunft gereicht hat und gesagt hat, Deutschland will in den nächsten 40 Jahren die Stromversorgung, die Energieversorgung umstellen von nuklear und fossil in Richtung Erneuerbare. Das heißt, jetzt geht es um die Frage des Wies, jetzt geht es nicht mehr um die Frage des Obs. Wo liegen jetzt die zentralen Herausforderungen? Wir haben jetzt in Deutschland einen Anteil Erneuerbaren an der Stromversorgung von knapp 25 Prozent. Das hat gezeigt, wie stabil unser Stromversorgungssystem ist, weil die ersten 25 Prozent konnten ohne große Probleme technisch integriert werden. Das wird bei den nächsten 25 Prozent nicht mehr möglich sein, weil das sind Durchschnittswerte. Und 50 Prozent erneuerbare Energien heißt, dass wir viele Stunden im Jahr haben werden, wo wir 100 Prozent und mehr Erneuerbare in den Netzen haben werden. Und wir werden andere Zeiten haben, wo die Erneuerbaren nicht zur Verfügung stehen und wo wir auch Stromversorgung sicherstellen müssen. Als wir im Jahre 2000 das Erneuerbare Energiengesetz geschaffen haben, damals haben wir quasi alle Erneuerbare Energien auf dieselbe Startlinie gestellt. Jeder Investor hat genau die Einspeisevergütung bekommen, die erforderlich war, um Investitionen dann auch rentierlich erscheinen zu lassen. Jetzt sind wir 13 Jahre später und wir haben gesehen, dass es aus diesem technologischen Wettbewerb zwei Gewinner gibt, nämlich Wind und Photovoltaik. All die anderen Energieträger wie Biomasse, Geothermie, sind nicht wirklich noch großartig ausbaufähig oder vielleicht auch gar nicht richtig ins Laufen gekommen. Auch die Wasserkraft können wir in diesem Land kaum noch steigern. Das heißt, die zentralen Säulen, auf die wir die Energiewende stützen werden, das ist Wind und das ist Photovoltaik. Diese haben Eigenschaften, die sind grundlegend anders als die von Kraftwerken, die wir bisher kennen. Zum Beispiel die Eigenschaft, dass die Produktion von Strom sich nicht nach der Strombörse, nach dem Preis an der Strombörse, also auch nicht nach der Nachfrage richtet, sondern ausschließlich nach dem Wetter. Und das wird es erforderlich machen, dass wir jetzt vieles in unserem Stromsystem neu denken müssen. Das heißt, die Energiewende ist im Kern eine Synchronisationsaufgabe. Wie schaffen wir das, diese fluktuierende Einspeisung von Strom aus Wind- und Photovoltaikanlagen zu synchronisieren mit der Nachfrage der Kunden. Das ist die eigentliche Kernaufgabe der Energiewende. Aber glauben Sie bitte nicht, dass Deutschland hier eine Sonderstellung einnehmen würde. Wenn Sie mal in die Roadmap 2050 der Europäischen Kommission hineinschauen, dann sehen Sie dort unterschiedliche Szenarien. Da gibt es ein Szenario mit hohen Anteilen von Erneuerbaren von 80 Prozent. Das ist ungefähr der Weg, den Deutschland gehen will. Dann gibt es andere Szenarien mit hohen Anteilen von Nuklear und CCS. Allerdings haben diese Szenarien eines gemeinsam. Sie gehen nämlich alle davon aus, dass der Mindestanteil von Erneuerbaren bei 60 Prozent und mehr liegt. Auch die Szenarien High Nuclear und High CCS haben einen Anteil von 60 Prozent und mehr an Erneuerbaren. Und wenn Sie dann schauen, was die Europäische Kommission sagt, welche die dominierenden Energieträger sein werden, dann werden Sie auch dort die Aussage finden, es sind Wind und Photovoltaik. Ich sage das deshalb, weil einige von den Herausforderungen, die wir jetzt hier in unserem Land erleben werden, vor denen werden andere auch stehen, vielleicht ein bisschen später, aber sie werden sich in ihrer Grundstruktur nicht unterscheiden. Und daraus resultieren jetzt eine Reihe von Notwendigkeiten. Und die kann man zusammenfassen mit dem Stichwort Flexibilität. Wir brauchen Flexibilitäten, zum Beispiel Flexibilitäten bei den residualen Kraftwerken, bei den konventionellen Kraftwerken. Die haben sich schon immer anpassen müssen an die Nachfrage der Kunden, die ja nicht konstant ist, sondern zwischen Tag und Nacht schwankt. Aber jetzt müssen sie sich in zwei Richtungen anpassen. Jetzt müssen sie sich nicht nur anpassen in Richtung der schwankenden Nachfrage, sondern auch anpassen 
hinsichtlich der schwankenden Einspeisung von erneuerbaren Energien, vor allem aus Wind- und Photovoltaikanlagen. Ralf, du hast hier vorhin ein Wort genannt, wo ich erst einmal widersprechen muss. Du hast von überschüssigem Strom gesprochen. Also überschüssigen Strom aus Erneuerbaren haben wir bisher nicht gehabt, weil es hat noch keine Stunde in Deutschland gegeben, wo wir mehr Strom aus Erneuerbaren produziert haben, als wir Nachfrage hatten. Aber natürlich hat es diesen Fall gegeben, wo wir so viel Strom produziert haben in Deutschland, dass sogar die Preise an der Börse ins Negative gedriftet sind. Das hat allerdings andere Ursachen als eine hohe Produktion von Erneuerbaren. Ich habe hier ein kleines Bild mitgenommen, das habe ich jetzt mal extra nicht als PowerPoint-Präsentation mitgebracht, weil ich möchte Sie motivieren, wenn Sie die Veranstaltung verlassen, auf unsere Homepage zu gehen. Da können Sie nämlich sowohl für heute als auch für alle Stunden in den vergangenen Wochen und Monaten nachvollziehen, wie die Stromproduktion gelaufen ist. Und was ich hier dabei habe, das ist die Zeit Weihnachten 2012. Da sehen Sie also hier oben die Nachfragekurve, die relativ niedrig ist, weil Weihnachten war warm, wir hatten wenig Stromnachfrage. Und hier unten farblich eingetragen die Produktion von Strom aus erneuerbaren Energien. Und Sie sehen, dass diese bunten Linien weit unterhalb der Nachfragekurve sind. Das heißt, wir hatten an dem ersten Weihnachtsfeiertag morgens um 8 Uhr, als wir dieses Phänomen von negativen Strompreisen an der einen Börse von 200, an der anderen von 400 Euro hatten, ungefähr 40 Gigawatt Nachfrage in Deutschland und ungefähr 20 Gigawatt Produktion von Strom aus erneuerbaren Quellen. Und äh, wenn Sie dann noch mal genauer hinschauen, dann werden Sie feststellen, dass die Kernkraftwerke zwischen 0 Uhr, erster Weihnachtsfeiertag und morgens 8 Uhr ihre Produktion gesteigert haben, dass die Braunkohlekraftwerke ihre Produktion gesteigert haben und der Markt hat funktioniert. Der Markt hat nämlich dafür gesorgt, dass diese Überproduktion von Strom entsprechend für Preise gesorgt hat an der Strombörse. Die sind nämlich ins Negative gekippt. 200 bis 400 Euro haben Sie zusätzlich bekommen für die Abnahme einer Megawattstunde Strom. Normalerweise bekommen Sie 50 Euro oder müsste der Käufer 50 Euro zahlen. Hier hat er 200 bis 400 Euro bekommen. Das heißt, da haben sich einige Leute gefreut, sowohl im Inland als auch im Ausland, weil sie bekamen nicht nur Strom, sondern auch noch Geld von den deutschen Kraftwerksbetreibern. Aber es hat andere gegeben, die haben sich geärgert, zum Beispiel die deutschen Stromproduzenten, denn die haben in dieser Zeit Geld verbrannt. Und geärgert haben sich natürlich auch die Kraftwerksbetreiber im benachbarten Ausland, weil ihre Kraftwerke konnten mit negativen Strompreisen nun mal wirklich nicht konkurrieren. Das heißt, der Markt muss lernen, mit solchen Situationen umzugehen. Er muss auch in der Lage sein, am ersten Weihnachtsfeiertag Kernkraftwerke und Braunkohlekraftwerke nicht hochzufahren, sondern wenn Nachfrage niedrig ist, weil es warm ist und weil viel Wind weht und deshalb die Stromproduktion aus Erneuerbaren hoch ist, dann eben auch entsprechend nach unten anpassen. Es gibt diese Sondersituation in Deutschland, aber meine Damen und Herren, machen Sie bitte nicht den Fehler, daraus zu schließen, dass das der Normalfall wäre. Es sind hier vor einigen Tagen die Zahlen Import und Export inklusive der Preise veröffentlicht worden. Und Sie sehen, dass diese Einzelfälle wie Weihnachten 2012 wirklich Ausnahmefälle sind. Deutschland hat 2012 43,8 Terawattstunden für 2,3 Milliarden Euro export, Entschuldigung, importiert und exportiert 66,6 Terawattstunden für 3,7 Milliarden. Und wenn Sie jetzt den Taschenrechner nehmen, dann stellen Sie fest, dass Unternehmen aus Deutschland im Ausland den Strom für durchschnittlich 55 Euro pro Megawattstunde verkauft haben und wir ihn importiert haben für 52,5 das heißt, wir haben mehr Geld für den exportierten Strom bekommen, als wir Geld zahlen mussten für den importierten Strom. Und das zeigt, dass solche Situationen Ausnahmesituationen sind, wie sie Weihnachten 2012 passiert sind. Und der Hauptgrund für diese Bilanz ist aus meiner Sicht Photovoltaik. Die Photovoltaik produziert den Strom in der Mittagszeit. Das ist dann die Zeit, wo er am teuersten ist. Und in diesen Zeiten haben wir natürlich auch Strom dann ins Ausland verkauft, das heißt Kunden aus dem Ausland haben Strom in Deutschland gekauft, weil er hier preiswerter zu bekommen war und das hat zu dieser entsprechenden Import- und Exportbilanz auch eben in Euro und nicht nur in Terawattstunden geführt. 
Flexibilität brauchen wir natürlich nicht nur auf der Erzeugerseite, sondern auch auf der Nachfragerseite. Eine der wichtigen Aufgaben der Zukunft wird sein, dass wir Nachfrage flexibilisieren, nicht so sehr bei den kleinen Haushaltskunden mit Smart Mietern, das wird ziemlich teuer, aber bei unserer Industrie, da gibt es noch große Potenziale und die müssen erschlossen werden. Und das alles funktioniert nur, wenn wir unser Transportnetz ausbauen. Wir sind da jetzt einige Schritte vorangekommen, aber wir haben da noch einiges zu tun, weil wir Engpässe hier in unserem Netz in Deutschland haben. Und dies, unter diesen Engpässen leiden auch nach, manchmal unsere Nachbarn. Da geht es nicht um Stromexport, dass also im Ausland jemand Strom in Deutschland kauft, sondern da geht es darum, dass manchmal auf der Nord-Süd-Strecke in Deutschland, wenn zum Beispiel besonders viel Wind im Norden weht und dann unten in Bayern oder Baden-Württemberg Strom gekauft wird, dass die Leitungen in Deutschland zu sind und der Strom dann einen Umweg sucht über Polen und über Tschechien und dass unsere Nachbarn das nicht lustig finden, das kann ich verstehen. Inzwischen gibt es da ja auch schon entsprechende Phasenschieber. Aus meiner Sicht sind die aber nicht zur Behinderung eines Stromhandels, sondern sind dafür da, dass diese Stromtransporte von Norddeutschland nach Süddeutschland nicht plötzlich über Polen und Tschechien gehen und dort die Netze durcheinander bringen. Und das kann ich auch nachvollziehen. Wie sieht jetzt die weitere Perspektive aus? Ich will ganz deutlich sagen, dass diese Synchronisationsaufgabe nicht nur wesentlich schwieriger wird, sondern auch viel teurer wird, wenn wir sie jeweils in Europa als nationale Aufgabe sehen. Diese Energiewende wird wesentlich günstiger, wenn wir sie als europäisches Projekt begreifen. Und da kommt es nicht darauf an, ob Sie 80 Prozent Erneuerbare anstreben oder vielleicht 60 Prozent. Die Aufgaben sind im Kern eigentlich dieselben. Und in den Zeiten, wo dann vor allen Dingen aufgrund von hohen Anteilen von Wind- und Photovoltaikanlagen in dem jeweiligen Land aufgrund der jeweiligen Wettersituation hohe Strommengen zur Verfügung stehen, wird jedes Land vor der Frage stehen, regle ich jetzt die Anlagen ab, dann schmeiße ich Kilowattstunden weg, die ich eigentlich umsonst produzieren kann, weil ich habe ja keine Produktionskosten. Andere Kraftwerke haben Brennstoffkosten, Wind und Photovoltaik haben keine Brennstoffkosten. Das heißt, die Investition ist teuer, aber wenn sie erstmal getätigt ist, ist jede Kilowattstunde für umsonst. Das heißt, die Alternative ist dann entweder die Anlagen abregeln und damit Geld vernichten oder aber die Strommengen zu speichern, und zwar jetzt nicht für wenige Stunden zu speichern, sondern dann auch über einen Zeitraum von einer Woche zu speichern. Wenn Sie das national versuchen, wird das sehr, sehr teuer. Das heißt, die günstigste Lösung für alle Länder wird sein, in dieser Situation zu schauen, ob es entsprechende Nachfrage im Ausland gibt und dann an dieser Stelle Strom zu handeln. Und wenn wir das vernünftig in Europa organisieren, so dass jeder etwas davon hat, dass die Länder, die auf der Grundlage von Wind und Photovoltaik ihre Energiewende durchführen und andere, wie zum Beispiel die skandinavischen Länder, die ja schon ein regeneratives Stromsystem zu großen Teilen haben auf der Grundlage von Wasserkraft, dieses dann mit ihren Anlagen tun, ich glaube, dann haben wir alle davon einen entsprechenden Gewinn. Das funktioniert natürlich nur, wenn Leitungen gebaut werden. Deutschland ist mit allen Nachbarn verbunden, aber mit Ausnahme von Österreich gibt es überall Engpässe in den Kuppelstellen zu den anderen Nachbarn. Das heißt, wenn wir diese Energiewende europäisch aufsetzen wollen, dann müssen natürlich diese Leitungen verbessert werden, sie müssen ausgebaut werden. Das wird aber nur passieren, wenn es einen gesellschaftlichen und politischen Willen diesseits und jenseits der, Welle, der, der Grenze gibt, dass dieses passiert. Und deshalb sind solche Veranstaltungen, wie ihr, Ralf, sie hier heute organisiert hat, aus meiner Sicht so immens wichtig. Es geht darum, Interessen zu identifizieren, es geht darum, Ausgleiche zu suchen, damit am Ende eben diese Energiewende verstanden wird als ein europäisches Projekt. Und äh, es ist richtig, dass wir auch hier in Deutschland mit vielen Problemen zu kämpfen haben. Ich sage ja lieber Herausforderungen, aber ich werde nicht müde, dabei zu betonen, dass es wesentlich mehr Chancen in dieser Energiewende gibt als Risiken und als Probleme. Und die größte Chance ist, dass wir hier in Zukunft in Europa ein Stromversorgungssystem haben, das frei ist von nuklearen Risiken, das frei ist von Treibhausgasemissionen und das zukunftsfähig ist und vielleicht sogar mal in dem internationalen Wettbewerb auch kostengünstiger als das, was andere Länder in den nächsten 10, und 20, und 30 und 40 Jahren machen werden. Schönen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit.
Schönen guten Tag. Hört man mich? Ja? Ja. Ich höre mich nicht. Ja, so ist gut. Prima. Christina Stemorg ist mein Name. Ich äh, werde diese erste Panel-Diskussion moderieren und möchte als erstes, <lacht> Entschuldigung, ich bin wie wahrscheinlich 80 Prozent hier ziemlich erkältet, <lacht> Ich möchte zunächst das Panel vorstellen. Ich fange mal mit mir an. Smart Energy for Europe Plattform Geschäftsführung ist eine Plattform, die sich vor allen Dingen um die Infrastruktur für Erneuerbare kümmert, also um Netze. Wir haben eine Plattform, die sich nennt Renewable Grid Initiative, wo TSOs, also Transmission System Operators und NGOs zusammenarbeiten, und anderes. Das nur ganz kurz. Ich bin der Böll-Stiftung lange, lange Jahre verbunden. Nicht als grünes Mitglied, sondern als äh, Mitglied der Mitgliederversammlung der Böll-Stiftung äh, und auch des Aufsichtsrats, als Sprecherin des Aufsichtsrats einige Jahre und freue mich immer wieder, wenn ich hier sein darf. Wer sitzt jetzt neben mir um mich herum? Äh, Cécile Maisonneuve äh, ist seit Februar 2013 Direktorin des Energy Council, ist das richtig? Energy Council des Institut Français de Relations Internationales. Also sie ist ganz frisch. Herzlichen Glückwunsch zu dem neuen Job, kann man vielleicht noch sagen. Sie versteht etwas Deutsch. Ähm, Cécile studierte Geschichte an der Sorbonne, äh, hat ihren Magister zum Thema französische Abrüstungspolitik gemacht, ist also internationale Strategin mehr. Sie war dann äh, ab 97 Mitarbeiterin im französischen, äh, in der französischen Nationalversammlung, fünf Jahre im Verteidigungsausschuss, zwei Jahre im Rechtsausschuss und drei Jahre im Auswärtigen Aus Ausschuss. Äh, 2007 ist sie dann gewechselt in die Industrie, hat Führungspositionen bei Ereva äh, wahrgenommen. Ereva ist vielen von Ihnen als äh, führender äh, Weltmarktführer in Nukleartechnologie äh, sicherlich bekannt, hat allerdings auch, ist auch bekannt durchaus für, ähm, für Technologie, für die, Wind, äh, für die Windenergie. Äh, wie gesagt, aber vor drei Jahren ist äh, Cécile hier noch aufgetreten als mehr oder weniger Vertreterin der Nuklearindustrie Frankreichs. Ähm, herzlich willkommen, Cécile. Olaf Osaka, Osika, Osika ist Direktor des Centers for European Studies in Warschau, ist ebenfalls mehr Experte für internationale Beziehungen. Äh, unter anderem ist er Mitglied des Wissenschaftlichen Rates der, äh, des Instituts for Western Affairs in Poznan und er ist im Herausgeberkreis von New uh, Europe. Olaf ist, er hat seinen Doktor im äh, Political and Social Science am ähm, European Institute in Florence äh, gemacht und graduierte am Institut für internationale Relations an der Uni Warschau. Äh, er ist, nennt sich selber Politiker, politischer Wissenschaftler, was ich interessant finde, weil diese Art äh, Wissenschaft glaube ich, mal richtig angeschaut gehört, äh, weil sie, glaube ich, mehr und mehr eine große Rolle spielen in der Politik. So now, uh, Rana has already announced it. I would like to switch to English because it is more friendly towards our guest um, if I speak, uh, of, 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 if we are on the same level, so to speak. Um, Rana said, Energiewende, German uh, Energiewende, Energy Transition, at least, Uh, much more difficult and much more expensive without the European integration. If we had here uh, a, Euro, a, a German context, I would say that we would have very quickly a debate about decentralizing and uh, centralized energy uh, strategies. Uh, we are not in a only German context. We will also can have this debate in, in the course of the debate uh, to, today, of course. But uh, I would like to give first our panelists the uh, opportunity to uh, say what you have prepared, what you uh, think it is the most important thing uh, when you think about uh, the integration of European energy policy. Uh, Olaf, if you could start, I would like to have Uh, one word before, 
uh, your institute was not too friendly and supportive with the Deutsche Energiewende. Uh, at least uh, that is uh, what I thought when I read your quarterly publication, uh, which says that uh, in a in a comment of the German Energiewende, said that the German promoter of the Energiewende were blamed to turn it into an ideological issue and they are not allowing a cool-headed analysis of costs and pace of the Energiewende. So now you have the floor. Thank you very much. That was for the good beginning, I guess. Yes. Okay. So actually everything what I say will be will be understood in the context of your introductory remarks, so actually I could stop here. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, first of all, I mean, you, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I think this is one of those rare opportunities where uh, Germany's neighbor, like Poland or the Czech Republic, they have a place at the table discussing and a given, and I'm very, very much thankful uh, to the Heinrich Bill Stiftung for uh, making this possible because indeed we very much uh, following uh, an given then we have our questions we have our problems with that and one of that is that we do see sometimes uh, the debate in Germany when it comes to energy given as uh, unnecessary ideological in a sense that we are all well I guess not all probably but uh, I think uh, there are not so many people who would argue that it's better to have a green energy than fossil fuels, but the problem is, of course, as always, uh, is how to make it possible. Yes? So, and I think if we switch to a more uh, down-to-earth or pragmatic perspective discussing in a given, then, then I think there is a much more room uh, for also Germany's neighbors, especially Eastern neighbors, both Poland and the Czech Republic, uh, to uh, uh, f there is much more room for them simply to participate in the debate and to be to be uh, to to be uh, seen uh, seriously. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, a very general observation, which is probably surprisingly or not to you. I mean, energy vendor is not a is not a theme for a public discussion in Poland. Yes, I mean this is not that we are discussing over beer, you know, just you know in cafeterias, you know, in other places. This is mainly a thing for uh, energy experts, energy specialists, of course, uh, governmental circles. I mean, all those people who who are professionalists in their, in their uh, uh, institutions. And uh, I'm saying this because it, uh, I think it's a pity, because uh, an agivend uh, is not only, uh, to put it differently, an agivend is not, is not about phasing out nuclear plants, as most of people uh, believe it is. Uh, and it is so because that was the message actually that was created here in Berlin and, 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 and delivered abroad that we are phasing out nuclear plants actually and switching to, to renewables. Uh, because in a given, there's much more than that. Yes, I mean, you know it better than I. It's a very comprehensive, all encompassing project policy uh, involving not only energy, but also German economy and German society. So this kind of reflection. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not there. It's not in Poland, and I guess uh, uh, I'm not allowed here to speak of other uh, neighbors. But I, as far as I know, there's also not the kind of uh, reflection which is also in the Czech Republic. As we were, I mean, a couple of months ago, we organized together with the uh, Stiftung for Polish German Cooperation a seminar in Warsaw on the energy event, and I remember Peter Boot was also. Uh, one of the speakers at that event. So we and we had at that time we had also Czech colleagues just to address uh, the issue. So that's the first thing that this is not a you know an event. There's not something that, that we are discussing this uh, publicly. This is something which occupies you know professionalists. Uh, having said that, uh, I'd like to stress that uh, whatever you will. Uh, hear from me. These are my private opinions. These are my private opinions because I guess that, uh, well, actually, I not only guess, I know that there are certainly other views reflecting various groups of interest also in Poland, I mean, including academia, business communities, also administration. So, again, there is nothing like the Polish point of view of the energy event. It's rather, you know, a number probably of views concerning just the future of the energy uh, vendor. So, whatever I say, this is, these are my private private opinions. Now, coming to, uh, to key points, uh, I was wondering, you know, how to present, you know, uh, to you uh, the problem of Polish perception of an event, and I came to the conclusion that probably it would be good just to, 
to, to, to do it by means of four types of emotions that in a given uh, has evolved or has evoked, sorry, has evoked in Poland. These are confusion, astonishment, irritation, and interest. Yes, I mean, not necessarily in that order you may choose, but I guess uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, for me, I mean, that order is quite uh, important. Why confusion? First of all, it came suddenly. I mean, we all know that it was not the beginning, as you said, it was 2000. Uh, Gerhard Schröder uh, government at that time, that was the, the beginning of the process, but the Fukushima disaster and the uh, political domestic context in Germany, actually, that was, I would say, the, the, the game changer, yes, in a way. So that was, therefore, everyone was actually surprised that almost overnight, uh, using the argument of tsunami, the German government decided to speed up phasing out nuclear uh, plants. Yeah, so that was a kind of a, 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 a confusion. But then it came a astonishment for the scale and the ambition of the Energiewende, a policy that can only be made in Germany. Yes, that was the kind of reflection that you know such a comprehensive, all-encompassing projects, policies, can, also, can only be made in Germany because if German decided, I mean, the German government decided and the public opinion decided to, uh, to implement that policy, it's only a matter of time and this will be there. Yes, that was the first uh, reaction. And I remember talking to many experts also in Warsaw, until in Warsaw, I mean, there, there was a number of skeptics saying, well, uh, it will... Uh, cost a lot of money, it will take time. There were questions, I mean, the economic dimension came to a forefront. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, how much this will cost? Who will pay, the business or the end consumers? Uh, what it means for German companies? What it means for the entire German sector, energy sector? And what it means, uh, last but not least, for the German economy? Yeah, so that was the, I would say, mood of discussing energy vendors. So as I said, it was from the very beginning, it was not about you know, uh, green, renewables, it was very much, and this is, a, I would say, typical for Polish discussion these days, and not without reasons, we seen it through the prism of economy and competitiveness of German uh, economy. Uh, okay, where are my cards? Here. Now, irritation. Yes, that's the, uh, that's the uh, I would say, third phase with uh, irritation. Uh, Actually, two problems. First of all, it was a unilateral decision uh, that was not consulted with anyone, which casted doubts, or sh actually, yes, casted doubts over the long term German commitments to European energy policy. Because, as you know, I mean, just for many years, we were discussing, debating certain things in the European Union, and, and all of a sudden, almost overnight, Germany is doing something that changes a lot. Yes, with regard to the future of EU energy policy without consulting anyone. Yes? So that was the first kind of irritation, yes, that uh, especially when I remember the Polish-German uh, dialogue back in the 90s and I remember German policymakers uh, coming to Warsaw and saying that, well, being a member of European Union requires you to consult with your neighbors, yes, uh, not take any unilateral actions, yes, because you're not an island just, yes. And that was a very, I would say, example that it's not always the case, yes. So, I mean, there was a lot of irritation resulting from the fact that Germany did it uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way uh, that uh, it, it actually excluded any other partners, especially neighbor countries. And here I come to the uh, second reason for the uh, growing irritation at that time, which was the uh, so-called loop flows, yes. I mean, the, the problem created by the fact that Although the decision was taken, as you said, 2000, in year 2000, uh, the grid system, the transmission networks, were not built since that time. Yes? So actually the increase of energy production from wind in the north was not matched by the new transmission lines. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the energy, the current went through the Polish and the Czech um, uh, transmission systems created a lot of problems, first of all, physical problems, yes, because it undermined the stability of the systems. And in this sense, it was not about money. It was not about that it's a bad energy because it's a green energy. It was very much about simply 
I fear that a German energy vendor may undermine the stability of the uh, Polish and Czech uh, transmission systems. And, it, and of course, it also costed uh, some money. I, as far as I know, it and estimates uh, say that it was about 50 million uh, euros. That was the that was the Polish contribution to the German energy vendor. Yes. 50, 50 million euros. That was the uh, Polish contribution to energy vend. Uh, but then, actually, uh, in the course of time, there came the, the real interest. Yes, I think as emotions went down, uh, especially on the German side, when actually just there were first lessons learned, uh, we kind of, uh, and again, just I have to find my proper... Uh, Okay, here it is. Here it is. Uh, so the emotions uh, went down, uh, and when one just you know puts aside the, the political dimension of the energy vent and focus on the nitty gritty of the energy vent on the problem, so the legal framework, you know, the financing schemes, and also the technical aspects, we. I guess, and I'm saying just we in Poland, just yes, we discovered actually that with all the differences, we face similar problems. Yes, the problem number one is how to change your energy model without putting at risk competitiveness of your economy. Yes, that's the first thing. And I guess when I follow German debates on that, I see that this is also one of the main themes uh, in German uh, discussion that uh, how to. Uh, do I mean how to implement energy vendor without actually uh, uh, putting at risk German uh, uh, economic interest? Then there was another problem which we all together face as to uh, how to win citizens. Yes, I mean how to convince people that it takes time, it takes uh, uh, it takes a lot of money, but it's worth doing. Yes? And especially when you consider the present situation in European Union, uh, no longer ago than a few weeks ago, no, it was more than a month ago, we had the first government in Bulgaria that collapsed because of the high energy prices, yes? And I'm not, of course, comparing uh, uh, the energy event with the situation in Bulgaria. What I'm saying is that in time of crisis, when you look at the entire European Union, you see that energy and energy prices are becoming a significant political factor. Yes, which may have different consequences. Yes, and now we're having uh, uh, Hungary is another example. Uh, Hungarian government is trying to low uh, down energy prices in the fear that it may create some social uh, unrest. Uh, the third thing: so, how to win citizens? This is also the Polish problem. How to con convince people? Yes, and also different groups. Uh, of society that actually sometimes you need to think long, I mean, long. you need a long-term perspective and you need to uh, devote huge resources for the sake of a better uh, future. Uh, then the lesson which, the lesson learned by Germany, I guess, and this is also a very interesting lesson to Poland, is how to coordinate uh, such ambitious uh, political agenda uh, between different branches of the government. Yes, we all have the same problem. Yes, how to uh, have on the same page or on the same board, you know, Minister of Economics and Minister of Environment. Yes, how to win hearts and minds of other ministers, other parties, you know, local authorities. Yes, I mean, these are all those things which are now, I guess, on the agenda in Germany. And we also have the same problems. And last but not least, uh, how to build what needs to be built. Yes, we're talking transmission systems, and we all know the famous you know, banana syndrome or not in my backyard uh, syndrome. We all, I mean, also in Poland, having the same kind of problem. We need to build up our uh, grid system, also from the north to the south, because there are more and more uh, energy coming also from wind from the north. But actually, just, you know, those people who have property of the land, they say, well, not in my backyard just yet. I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I'm supporting just, you know, the, what, what, what you want to do just, you know, to switch from the, uh, to switch towards, you know, the green model of economy, but please build it somewhere else, yes? And this is exactly also the problem that, uh, as far as I know, uh, Germany is facing this day. So, summing up, because I'm picking probably already too long, 
however, the, however bad the beginning was. And to be honest, and I guess we all here uh, to say openly what we think, yes, not to prevent that everything was fine. The beginnings were really bad, and we all hope that uh, that was only the beginning. Yes, and the future uh, seems, at least from my perspective, uh, a better one. Uh, for one reason, first of all, it's not true that Poland is not uh, uh, that Poland is not uh, embracing yes, the green change, yes, that we are not embracing renewables, you know, all those new technologies. Because, as you said, again, I mean, this is also, sooner or later, the future probably of most European nations. The only thing is that you need to do it on, on your, I mean, in, its, uh, in your own pace, yes, and taking into consideration local ramifications, national ramifications, yes, also situation of your uh, economy, yes. So I guess... This is this is a, a very good I mean sign for the future that we may uh, do it later yes but we will do it perhaps even better sometimes because we will we, we, we because we will have the opportun opportunity to avoid many lessons which Germany is now uh, going uh, through uh, and I think that uh, the, it seems to me that the future is also uh, looks quite bright because also on the German side you know since I mean after in the last two years. You see that there is a uh, growing, uh, there is a growing, or it seems, it seems to me that there is a growing uh, understanding that energy vendor needs to be adjusted, yes, to, to many uh, unexpected problems. I mean, starting from the uh, situation of what we have in Europe when it comes to European economy, to you know legal ramifications, and also to, to the fact that we are, I mean, democracies, yes. So we need to convince people that they have to pay today uh, uh, higher uh, energy bills because this is in their interest, in their long-term interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. I think it was a very, very good and systematic overview uh, on the challenges that uh, the Germans are facing. Uh, that is good to hear. I mean, for, for to have it on one or two pages, I think it's good to work on it. Uh, also in a bilateral uh, way, I think it makes sense. So we have a number of, uh, of issues now on the table, but uh, I would like to give Cecile first the opportunity to say something. So to the West, uh, Hollande has uh, announced that he wants to cut the uh, energy dependence of his country from nuclear uh, by 25% by the year 2025. Uh, that means uh, that, uh, and he wants to push also for wind and solar. Uh, from, from the outside view, it seems to be that we have, will have there a second uh, transformation énergique uh, in in, Fran in France, uh, so that because we in Germany didn't have that much nuclear energy to get rid of, as you have it, uh, and also of course the um, the uh, first uh, well initial uh, economic uh, development of the uh, renewable energies were much farther than uh, we have it in France. So my question would be. Perhaps you explain a bit what your uh, view is on uh, the process that you are uh, now in. But my question would be in particular whether you see with this second energy transition in, uh, in Europe, whether it is a second energy transition, whether this is also perhaps something uh, for a, a tougher, tighter, tighter in particular, um, um, cooperation between Germany and uh, France, um, Ralf has mentioned it in his introductory notes uh, that it would be good to have again uh, something like the uh, core, a core Europe on energy, so to speak, or the, uh, uh, on energy transition, and if that could be um, well, could be organized by a cooperation between a better coordination uh, between Germany and France. So this is up to you. Thank you, Christina. Um, well, to, to answer your question first on, on what's going on in France, this uh, national debate on energy transition, as it's called, 
Um, so it has started few few months ago uh, in January, and uh, it's supposed to finish in July with a bill uh, on the board of the parliament uh, next se September. So this is the official calendar. And in the meantime, what's going on? Well, if you ask to 80% uh, of the French people what is the national debate on energy transitions, they will answer you the what. This is a recent poll published. So the, the government has decided to advertise for this debate because it's for the first time in France that we have a debate involving uh, citizens, uh, NGOs, associations, local territories. It's not a debate made in Paris, not only in Paris, in the 7th arrondissement of Paris, in the minister of, uh, of, uh, in, at the prime uh, minister office. So it's, it's a very new debate. It, some will tell you it's very complex. You have many colleges of experts, of companies, uh, it is truly the, uh, complex architecture, but the issue itself is complex. So uh, I think this, uh, this deserves uh, putting in place something uh, uh, rather which looks like the object it has to deal with. Um, regarding what you said about Hollande's announcement on, uh, on reducing the part of uh, nuclear uh, energy, I'm not talking about dependence because... Uh, nuclear energy in France wasn't is a choice, so it is to to reduce the, the part is a choice too. It's uh, dependence. We are dependent on oil because we can't do differently nuclear. It's uh, it's not the same uh, the same logic. So Hollande announced uh, this for 2025. Um, for the moment, uh, there is absolutely no implementation measures. Um, the safety authority clearly stated that uh, it, uh, because what at stake for the moment is only the shutdown of one nuclear power plant in Fessenheim, in uh, Alsace, and uh, the safety authority clearly stated that it would need require about four or five years to shut it down after the end of the current mandate of the of the president, and uh, and the. Um, the current government said that it was a political decision. It is not a safety decision. So it's, it's important to, to put it clearly. So currently the debate in France is far beyond this only question of nuclear because the debate is, not, is far beyond electricity. You mentioned the, the will, and the, it's a commitment, actually a commitment uh, within the EU framework to develop solar and wind energy. But it's also about uh, energy efficiency. It's also about uh, fighting against fuel poverty. And uh, as far as uh, renewables, I think it's, it's also uh, important to remind this audience that uh, in terms of final energy consumption, Germany and France have nearly an equal part as far as renewables are concerned. It's 12.5% of your final energy consumption. It's 12.1% of our final energy consumption. So different between, the difference being between electricity, where Germany has much more um, developed renewable energy, if you take out hydroelectricity, and the uh, heating, where f renewables are much more developed in France than in Germany. So. It's, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is a debate on energy transition, not on electricity revolution. It's, uh, it's uh, important to, to keep that in mind because, especially in France, everything which has to do with energy efficiency will be absolutely key for France to meet its uh, 2020 goals. Not only the, the goal about uh, to energy efficiency themselves, but also the goal uh, on uh, the share of renewables because we will further develop the, the, the share of renewables in, uh, for, for heating. So um, the debate, uh, is this debate a new uh, opportunity for cooperation? Well, uh, Recently, the, we, had this, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Traité de l'Elysée, Elysée Treaty between uh, France and Germany, and uh, there were some cooperation announced, and strangely enough, at the time where you have this energy vendor, we have this national debate on energy transition, what was the result? What was announced was a 
uh, office on renewables, a common office on renewables between France and Germany. And when you look at what they are doing, they are doing very interesting things uh, about uh, especially the legislation in Germany that translate it in French so that the level of information is, uh, is good. But we could really wonder only that. Is this the only area where we can cooperate together? This, this is, for me, uh, an issue of establishment. Even if I must say I'm not, uh, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, as you said, I was previously working with the river, and uh, actually it's my second time in the foundation because you invited me uh, when I was with the river. You were innovative enough, and I was brave enough to come. And uh, the, for me, what, what happened between the river and Siemens in 2009 before uh, the acceleration of the energy vendor was already the sign that there is something strange in this uh, relation of cooperation between France and Germany. Because having been inside the, the, that company, we you had... Have to dis you have to explain that a bit, what was... Uh, well, Siemens had some share in uh, Arriva's capital, and uh, both companies were working uh, together, especially uh, Arriva and PEGMBH is in Erlangen with uh, Siemens, and Siemens <laughs> decided to step out of, of Arriva's capital and announced an alliance with, uh, with Rosatom at the time, which didn't uh, uh, further um, grow. So this was, uh, this was, of course, a shock, and uh, I think uh, there are many reasons accounting yeah, for It cost for that. billions. It cost billions, and, and, uh, and it, uh, it cut something in this, in this cooperation. But uh, to come back on this area of cooperation, I, I had prepared uh, I want, well, many slides, but I want to show you one. Uh, I think the, there is something here. It's a recent poll made on the, on the perceptions in France, in Germany, about, the, yes, about how French people see their own energy policy and how German people see their, their energy policy. The, the poll was made uh, for the Genshagen Stiftung and the Institut Montaigne last autumn. And there were also some cross-cutting questions. So... You can see that uh, about the opinion of uh, French people on the German uh, atom Ausstieg. So 53% of the French people think it's a good thing, and uh, a large majority of, uh, of German people also do think that. And uh, que the question was uh, asked about um, what about uh, maintaining nuclear in France. So 64% of French people said that's a good thing, when uh, only 19% <laughs> of the German uh, people asked uh, thought that was a good thing. So there are many things to be, to be said uh, when you see those results, especially uh, how you can interpret the fact that 64% of the French people um, think it's a good thing to maintain nuclear, but at the same time, um, only 51% of French people are satisfied about the, the French energy policy. And there, uh, the point I would like to make is, uh, is exactly what I mentioned previously. We are talking about energy, not only about electricity. Um, and what is currently seen as unbearable by French households and by the French economy is the fossil fuel bill. Last year, it was equivalent to the trade deficit, the French trade deficit, that is to say 60 billion euros. And 60 billion euros is uh, the amount of revenues which come from the nuclear uh, sector in France, positively. So it gives you um, the terms of the debate in France when you speak about the energy transition. Cost is a central issue. And you can see it here. It's a central issue for 65% of French people. They think that, yes, we must have an energy transition provided this is neutral in terms of cost, when only 47 Germans say the same thing. 
So what it means, it means that um, in the current French situation, difficult one, social one, economic one, political one, the, what, the options which will be chosen which will have to be a fine-tuned policy mix and that everything which has to deal with the big changes will not happen. It will be something very smooth and there I think we have an area of divergence with Germany that the, the rhythm of the transition will not be at all the same as you are knowing here. And actually, I don't think we could anyway have the same reason that you have, because you need also that your neighbors are relatively stable in order to uh, move forward in your energy transition. Because we are not only looking at your energy transition, we are actively taking part of it. We are taking part of it with, uh, because we are interconnected in terms of electricity, so in 2011, French was n France was net exporter to Germany. In 2012, French was net importer for economic reasons, because it's very cheap to buy a, a, a zero marginal cost energy. And um, that's what French utility does. The problem is that the price signals which are sent in order for the investment to be made in the backup um, plants and in the peak load plants are not made, and maybe not made. And there is a point I want to underline. There will be no energy transition with those investments to be made, so there will be no energy transition without the investment from the utilities. And there we have a point, which is not only a Franco-German point, it's an EU point, because clearly uh, the internal, internal electricity market which is to be achieved, completed next year. It's like, I would say, it's, uh, well, you, you, will, you will forgive me this expression, but it, it's a sacred cow we all worship, but that nobody respects anymore. Let me explain why. Because we, um, 20 years ago, under the influence of the uh, idea of liberal ideas, we said, well, there will be an internal electricity market, the idea being that it will transport electricity, cheapest electricity, uh, hydroelectricity from the mountains, nuclear where it's cheap, gas where it's cheap. This was the idea. Now, what do we have? We have renewables which are funded outside of the market with feed-in tariffs in Germany, in France, in other countries. We have some interconnections that are not financed by the market. That's why we have this infrastructure package in Brussels. And the backup, uh, as I said, the backup plans are not financed because they are not profitable anymore. And utilities are not only divesting from Europe for some of them, but are saying, this money I divest, I will invest it outside of Europe. So we have to cooperate today, not only between France and Germany, but as in the EU context, to see what we do with this market. We have some commitments regarding renewable sources of energy and we will uh, do the maximum to respect them because it's a, it's a political commitment. But clearly, if we go on the way it goes on, the energy transition will be only a total mess in Europe. So I, I'm sorry to be a bit negative, but uh, I really think that the current situation will not be bearable and could put at risk your energy transition as well as ours. Thank you, Ceci. Um, before I give <laughs> a lot of work to do, I mean, if we have critical neighbors from the West and from the East uh, criticizing our energy, then I think we should perhaps better, better sit together. Is, criticism solve. is part of the French <laughs> DNA, so yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, uh, Rainer. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank Cecile and Olaf for their most interesting statements. Um, I totally agree. There has been a lack of consultation. Um, I think we cannot make the past unhappened, but we can talk about 
how we're going to do it better in the future. And I really think that uh, all our countries are facing very similar problems, and some of them were just addressed in your statements. Um, we do have a not really consistent legal situation in Europe. Because on the one hand, we have the free market, the single market, also in electricity, with the exception of um, a European binding target of 20% renewables. Um, we have uh, the clear statement that the jurisdiction over the energy mix is a national decision in all countries. And here again, the exception of the 20% renewables, which was a European decision. Um, and this creates a lot of problems, because on the one hand, we are interconnected. Germany, as I said before, is interconnected with all countries, with Austria perfect, with all the other ones with some limitations. Uh, we do not decide over the single market anymore here in Germany, we have given away, as your countries have given away this to the European level. So the European Commission is watching over that all member states are obeying to the rules of the single market. But when we look at what is happening right now, um, and that's why I said uh, we are all facing similar problems, uh, the, the conflicts come from come basically in two areas. On the one hand, we all have developed our own support scheme for renewables, uh, which often don't go together very well. Um, on the other hand, we all observe that you just named it the disinvestment pr problem with the uh, residual generators. When you look at the, um, the generators here in Europe, they have all not been built under market conditions. In all our countries, they were constructed under totally different um, uh, conditions. We had uh, guaranteed monopolies. Um, and then in the late 90s, uh, via Europe, we liberalized our markets. And then for a while, uh, it went okay. But now, uh, 15 years later, we see that in all markets, regardless whether you have a high share of renewables or a low, there's a lack of money for reinvestment. And that's why we have right now a very different perception of the situation. If you look at Britain, if you look at France, if you look at Germany or Poland, everybody is coming up with his or her own solution. The British are establishing a capacity market. I understand that the French are doing the same thing. We are debating it here in, in Germany. A year ago, many people thought it's not necessary. Now we are more talking about how we're going to do it best. I don't exactly know how the debate is in, uh, in Poland. Um, so where I really see a need for cooperation, and I'm saying now bilateral, trilateral, or multilateral cooperation is mainly on these two issues. Now, first of all, energy security. How are we going to make sure that we are not going to have blackouts in our electrical systems in the next years? This is not a question of how many renewables, but how many uh, you know, adjustable capacity do I have in those hours uh, of, of peak demand. And the second issue is how are we going to support renewables in a way uh, that we don't interfere with each other's interest. Um, I want to be very open. I don't expect the solution to come from Brussels. I don't think that Europe of the 20, 27 is ready yet. Uh, for a European solution on this. I wish it would be different, but I'm realistic and I don't see that. So I really hope that uh, neighboring countries will sit down, will figure out what the issues are that they want to work on together and come up with regional solutions. And I think that your two countries, Poland and France and Germany, my country, is going to play a key role in this. We are not alone, of course. I mean, uh, we have very many contacts, to, as I said before, to Austria and uh, up to Scandinavia. And I, I don't think that we should talk about it as a, a closed club. Uh, but I think there is a very big need for neighboring countries to sit down and not wait for Brussels to come up with a solution, but uh, to work on regional solutions. 
um, because these two markets, the market for energy security and the market for renewables, uh, if we don't cooperate on this, we are really getting into a mess, I'm very sure, because the rules of the single market uh, get in collision with these two areas that I just mentioned. Okay, the question just for, for both of you. I mean, how uh, are the, the questions of market structure, uh, for instance, for capacity markets also discussed in your countries uh, at all or uh, only on a, on a scientific level or how do you uh, discuss that? Uh, but in particular, I would like to ask uh, what do you think about this offer or this uh, idea of a of a bilateral or trilateral uh, cooperation, uh, just perhaps an informal cooperation between uh, countries which uh, may be then also jump over, so to speak, uh, on, on those who are responsible. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that someone from the German government is here, but probably not uh, in a shape that he or she can uh, offer a solution or offer something which can help us here. So, well, to you, the question. Yes, as uh, Rainer said, the, there is in France uh, a capacity market which is put in place, and uh, actually there, there could be 27 put in place if things go on like that, because capacity market is a taboo issue currently in Brussels. Uh, but countries do have to, to find solutions. As for the cooperation and the, the better framework for it, um, to a certain extent, it, it makes me think about what we have seen uh, in the, on the monetary front. Um, because, in a way, uh, electricity is like money, it circulates freely. And uh, you have this theory of uh, optimal monetary zones. So in a way, we, we, we had the coexistence between something which was very fluid, which could circulate, but budget, national budget, budgetary policy. And this is a bit the same here. We have this uh, deregulated internal electricity market put in place, and at the same time, totally national policies in terms of uh, setting up uh, and defining the mix. So as... Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but uh, the idea of uh, of getting rid of the Commission for me, even if I'm French, is uh, is not something uh, something which is very natural to me. But I agree that we have to move on because what is at risk is exactly what you said. It's just a blackout. It's it's very very concrete, uh, very concrete thing. And uh, what shape could this cooperation take, yes, it could start as it often started in, in European history with informal meetings, consultation meetings, and uh, the question is, will we, will we wait for the crisis to happen before meeting, or will, will we do it uh, before? Uh, this is uh, for me the question. Well, uh, I mean, it's clearly a dilemma, and you cannot solve a dilemma by definition. So you can only try, you know, to overcome it somehow. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I, well, I fully agree with you, uh, although I'm Paul, I can say that. I mean, it's hard to imagine how you want to uh, go about the problem without a commission, actually. I mean, there are many policies when you may have a bottom-up approach, but in this case... I doubt very much. I mean, what it means that we have on the one hand, we're the commission with all the regulatory powers. On the other hand, we are some on a regional basis, do some agreements, and the question is always, you know, how far a region stretches. I mean, where is the end of, of a region, especially when you build so many, when you build transmission uh, um, lines? And this is what we need to do, yes? Also storage capacities, uh, because we need them very badly, and especially in Poland, we need both, yes? We are the beginning of the road. We definitely need a better coordination of the TSOs, so the trans uh, transmission system operators. Uh, and we need uh, some, you know, code of conduct, so all those soft, uh, I would say, uh, solutions that we may somehow elaborate to a certain level on the original basis, but then, I mean, just if there is no commission, so actually, well, should we uh, 
forget about the commission in terms of you know setting you know uh, some long term solutions because I mean from again I might be wrong but it seems to me that for some countries it might be a very convenient situation which you whenever the commission does what is good for you and your economy like in case of renewables you support it whenever the commission cannot catch up with the pace of your policies then you say well actually we should forget about the commission and then do it just bottom up i don't think that this is a best way to go forward and especially because uh if we go that way then the energy policy and maybe we are already on that way the energy policy will become will fall a victim of the general trend that we are having in the European Union, renationalization of policies. And you can, of course, renationalize you know, uh, common security and defense policies because it's about capabilities and resources, it's about political will. You may somehow you know, uh, renationalize you know, foreign policy because it's a regional uh, thing, and again, some countries have global interests, others don't. You may think of many policies when you may have this kind of a just bottom-up yes, uh, uh, trend. But in this case, as we are talking about physical connections, about a common market, I well, I, I simply I don't know how it should work. But maybe I'm just simply uh, my my imagination doesn't stretch so far. Thank you. Uh, I would like to open up now the debate to you. So if you want to ask something, comment on something. Uh, there are microphones in the middle, or in the in the aisle here, and uh, feel free to comment and to uh, ask something. But first, I would like Rainer to comment. I think there might have been partially a misunderstanding. I certainly don't want to exclude the Commission. I said I don't want to wait for the Commission. And the problem, I don't think, is the Commission. The, the problem is the 27 member states. These two issues that I mentioned before, support schemes for renewables, we have had, if I count it correctly, at least three initiatives now from the Commission over harmonizing the support schemes in Europe. And all three attempts failed. And from what I hear from the Commission, the ideas that are circling there, I think if they come up with a new initiative, they're probably going to fail for a fourth time because they don't get an agreement among the 27 member states, maybe in the parliament, but not among the 27 member states. And when I look at the other big issue that I mentioned, how are we going to organize capacity markets because we need a second source of finance because the single market is not going to make sure that there is enough revenue for the residual generators that we also need in this transition period. I think it's the same thing. I don't think if the Commission would come with a proposal now, I don't see an initiative there. I don't want to wait for this initiative. And I also think it could be difficult on the European level now for all 27 member states to agree on this. So either we're going to look at this situation and then we're going to see national support schemes for renewables being further developed in all member states. We are going to wait until we see capacity markets being created in Britain, in France, uh, maybe next year over the next later in Germany, Poland, and so on, all national policy, or are we going to sit down and do consultation and maybe we'll come up with some solutions that are at least are harmonized between our countries? I mean, Olaf, you said before that you saw a lack of consultation. I'm just promoting exactly this. And if my country should come up with a solution for the capacity problem next year after our election in September, I wish it would not be a national solution. I don't see a European solution, but I wish our future government would sit down with the Polish uh, government, with the French government, with the Austrian government, with the Scandinavian governments and say, hey, can we not work on this together? Because if we do it together, it's going to be cheaper for all of us. That's my idea. I don't want to exclude the Commission. I just don't want to wait for them. And uh, Cecile before, and then uh, the first microphone. Yeah, j just one comment. The, um, what one problem which could arise with this proposal coming now? I think it's uh, maybe it's coming two years too late. In the meaning that it could be, it could give the the impression that Germany is trying 
I'm very blunt, to mutualize the cost of its choice. So, so, this is, this is uh, I'm, I'm saying what is also currently heard in my country. And uh, yes, that this, this is certainly what we have to discuss on. But the perception is also important in this matter. Yeah. Okay, please. Rogero Schleicher, I'm strategy consultant on energy issues here in Berlin. I've worked for the previous government for Agora, for CEFEP, on, on European issues. That's a little bit of the background. I think we sh must see in these difficult European discussions that there is another dimension because we have uh, a time problem. Uh, innovation rhythms have accelerated by about a factor of five we have, uh, meanwhile, it has been pushed by strong investments of the US, of Japan, of Germany. We have a revolution in uh, semiconductor technologies, pushing photovoltaics, pushing uh, power uh, semiconductors, power um, electronics, and pushing the whole control technology. And that is an avalanche of change, which is overwhelming the whole sector, which is a problem for all of us. And I think you said you would like, you would probably see in France a slower development than in Germany. I think a slow development as we had in the past is not possible anymore. We are in a very complicated and probably also messy joint learning process. And the question is how we organize that. I think also there's no simple solution uh, on what to do at the European level and what to do at country levels. In this complicated, accelerated phase of change, I think we must have, and we do not have yet, an idea of a multi-level system which encompasses the whole of Europe. Traditionally, we have centrally organized national electricity systems. We have regions coming up as an important level, and we have Europe coming up as an important level. And until now, we have no idea how to coordinate these different levels in governance structures, in technology, and also in markets. So we have, I think, for solving this cooperation problem, the necessity of developing a vision for this multi-level system in different dimensions. And I think uh, it's also uh, sometimes dangerous to uh, blame the whole mess which is coming with this technology development into conflicts between different countries. Thank you. Michaelis Schreier, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, you will not wonder that I take the floor as a former commissioner on this issue. What should we do in Europe and what by bilateral or trilateral cooperation? Um, in the sense, as Rogero said it, um, we are, the starting point was totally nationalized electricity and energy markets and we are going now to more cooperation on the European level and this is of course a very difficult way. Uh, what the goal is is to have the internal market and then uh, in this question of the internal market uh, it is not necessary always to wait um, on the um, on the consensus, but we have here a quality majority voting. Uh, so we, we can go further in this, and uh, I wouldn't uh, risk, put it uh, at risk. Then we have the issue that we have the 20% common goal uh, for the renewable energy, and we have in the moment the discussion uh, whether already in this year or in the next year we should decide on the European level on the targets for the year 2030. And I think uh, there is um, a lot of common ground to say we must already at the latest in the next year put the targets for the year 2030. And this should be, again, common targets and then differentiated as legal binding targets for the member states. And in this law for the uh, promoting of the renewable energies, it's also the provision that member states should cooperate 
in particular in the sense cooperation of the support systems. Uh, because in the moment it is clear, it's not possible in the moment to have a common support system, to have common feed-in tariffs, because each country says we have the best. So it will be step by step, and here uh, is a possibility of Try uh, bilateral or trilateral cooperation. But I want to uh, push also for another solution. We have now um, also the ideas of macro regional cooperation uh, for the TSO. It's, it is very important that for coming to a trans European net, a trans European grid. Uh, the proposal is that there are corridors of common interest, so uh, the priority corridors uh, for, for Europe. And this is, of course, a basis for more cooperation, but this cooperation could and should, in my view, be on the basis of um, enhanced cooperation so that it is clear it is under the roof of the European Union, but... Uh, that there are macro-regional uh, macro cooperations which could go ahead and making sure that at the end we could have, as uh, Ralph said, at the end we could have a European Union of the renewable energies and for energy efficiency. Thank you. What, is the, what are you signing up? I had a Oh, you are just you are just queuing. No, yeah, I mean, oh, there, okay. is, okay. there are many microphones, so there must there will be many queues. Oh, all right. So and I didn't see you. I'm sorry for that. Okay. I take two more, and then we uh, give it back to the panel because otherwise it would be too much. So I'm Skuli Sigurdsson, Max Planck Institute for History of Science, and my question for the podium is clearly, according to Cecile. We are narrowing it, the discussion, if we think of this as an electricity discussion. But if I therefore stay within the narrow realm of electric power, the question is, what can the Europeans learn from two national contexts, the U.S. context where you've had blackouts on the East Coast in 65, 77, and 2003, or more recently in India, which also had one or two years ago a huge blackout because blackouts seem to be the ghost in this discussion which isn't quite mentioned, but everybody is fearing. And I would want to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Okay, one more, Raffaele. Uh, Raffaele Piria, uh, Smart Energy for Europe platform. I think that... Uh, it's a honor for the Burstiftung to invite the speakers who give uh, a realistic impression of the rough, sometimes, wind uh, around the German and given in parts of the European public and elites, but there are other voices. I think, and that's my personal feeling, speaking with many people in many countries, that millions of citizens look at Germany and look at the, not at Germany as a country, but at the transition to renewables taking place in Germany and in other countries with hope. And Madame Maisonneuve also showed that uh, a large share of the French citizens welcome the nuclear exit of Germany, probably because they see some hope also for their own future, or uh, maybe for other reasons you can explain. And I have worked particularly on one country, and in Germany two years ago it was a common <coughs> opinion that in Norway, that the Norwegians or many Norwegians or most Norwegians would not accept collaborating with an, uh, an agivender, which was not yet called in that way by many people, because of a number of reasons, because they don't want to, um, to have uh, impact on their own environment if they use their storage more intensively or because they fear increasing prices. I have worked uh, a lot, I've talked with hundreds of people there. We will present to the public in the next months a joint declaration signed by um, trade unions, by the electricity business in Norway, by NGOs, by development organizations, uh, saying exactly the opposite. So uh, foreign energy policy is also policy with the people. It's also about explaining the vision. And uh, I think Germans need to be very respectful while doing that, but not to be too shy, because the energy vendor 
provides a vision that uh, um, a lot of people around Europe needs. And now we are talking about the problems of the few around the German energy vendor, and it's a good thing, but uh, there are also problems uh, in uh, uh, continuing with the conventional model as in other countries. So uh, we should uh, look at both sides. Thank you. So uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to, uh, all, all three of you, the uh, opportunity to comment on that if you wish. Uh, it, it, it was the time to slow development, uh, the macro-regional cooperation, which I think, which I would strongly emphasize, because there the Commission was really smart with the project of common interests. Um, the blackouts and the Norway example. Who wants to start? Sissy again. Okay. Um, about um, the remark on the slow development in France. My remark also has to do, to, to do with the rhythm of the transition, and I think really it's very important because uh, you also speak about uh, the rhythm of innovation, but this is, we, there is a time for technology, there is a time for politics, which is important in energy. There is a time for social issues which are to be dealt with because when we speak about green growth, we speak about destructive creation and you destruct somewhere, you build other, other, uh, somewhere else. But when it's in a very difficult context, context in terms of employment, such as in France, this has to be very carefully fine-tuned. And otherwise, it's, it will not be accepted by anybody in the population. So this is why the question of rhythm is important. And I said slow, I should have said controlled rhythm. And this is, for example, why France chose the, the, to make bids as far as uh, offshore wind parks are scheduled in, in the northern coast of France because it's a way to control what we are doing and not to create bubbles because it's also about uh, this, this risk. It's, it's really th something that the French economy can't afford currently. Um, as far about the question... Um, the comparison between the U.S. and India and the blackouts. This, the problem with, uh, with electricity networks in a very deregulated system, there can, it can happen there is no investment because there is, it's not uh, profitable. And in a too regulated system, there can be inv investment as well because it's not profitable. So this is the problem again that you have to... to, to to put in place a framework that is that enables the investment to be made. And uh, about the remark uh, on the, the interpretation of the, of the poll that, uh, that maybe a uh, German decision is a hope for French people, you, I think the, my interpretation is a bit different. Uh, it's that France fundamentally respects Germany's decision to step out of nuclear. German people don't want nuclear energy. We respect that choice. What you must understand is the moral dimension you see in this choice and that we respect is totally absent in France. Really, it's, it's important to know that. It's, it's, not, uh, it's, a, it's an economic, it's a social choice. It's also a political choice which has been made. And very often people think that it was a goalist choice. Not at all. The Communist Party, the Trade Union, the Socialist Party, everybody was on board on that choice. This is why it's very strong. And if we rewrite history thinking that it was a goalist choice, you will miss what the point uh, about nuclear energy in, uh, in France. Okay, comment on the end. Island, you want to comment on this? Well, I'll start with the blackout, or yeah. I would say it rather positively, system reliability. Uh, we're a little bit uh, spoiled here in Germany. Um, Germans uh, don't have any experience, really, with blackouts, as many other countries. Uh, the statistics say that uh, electricity supply is interrupted less than 15 minutes per year. We as private consumers usually don't feel that unless we are in a region where something really happens, like last year, for example, in Munich. Um, this is a very important factor. It says something about the quality of this electricity system. 
So when we debate with our industry over electricity prices, I always say, what about the quality issue? Yeah? Because for a little bit less money, I don't think anybody in Germany who has a big business would uh, like to have a situation like uh, companies in, uh, for example, the United States are used to. Yeah? So um, electricity supply is a question of prices, but it's also a question of reliability. So when I talk about system reliability as also national issues now, um, I think this is, leads exactly to the point that I tried to make before. Um, we have the single market. And uh, there has been for quite some time, and many people in this country still believe that, and I would say the majority of the people working in the Commission also still believe that, that this single market would provide enough revenue not only to pay for the operation, but also for reinvestment of generators. And I think they're wrong. They are really wrong. We have seen, after a little while, in all free markets in electricity, that we have a problem of refinancing investments. So if you leave this second issue up to the national level, and you, Cecile, just said that France has this capacity uh, market now, which means nothing else but an interference with the free market because you're not only getting as an investor money from selling your kilowatt hours at the energy exchange, you have a second source of income. Just as the renewables not only have revenue from selling electricity kilowatt hours at the market, but also have a second source of income in Germany from our Renewable Energy Act. And these two systems, the capacity payments for the residual generators and the support scheme for the renewables are, I mean, <laughs> nobody can deny that, are a conflict with the single market. And Europe as a whole does not have an answer to that. <laughs> I don't see them coming up, the commission with an initiative um, to, to harmonize these things. So I would be happy. I'm a really strong believer of Europe. Uh, I would be happy uh, if, if the Commission would come up with a solution to this problem, to these two problems, uh, and uh, if uh, the European uh, governments, uh, the Council, would agree on a solution and uh, we would get the approval also from the European Parliament. Fantastic. I just make a realistic view of the assessment of the current situation, and I don't think it's happening. So... Now we have two choices. Either we all come up with national solutions or we do some bilateral, trilateral, multilateral cooperation. And I say before I want to see more national solutions, I would like to see cooperation between countries. Consultation that should result also in some harmonization on the policy on these two issues, capacity markets and support schemes for renewables. That is actually my main point. And the alternative to that is indeed renationalization of policy because then everybody does his own and uh, the single market, yeah, the commission then is you know, always two steps behind. Uh, are they interfering with the capacity market in Britain? I don't think they dare to. Are they going to interfere with the capacity market in France? I don't think they will, but they're not happy about it. They're not happy about it. They see the conflict with the single market as they see it with the support schemes of renewables. So as good Europeans, we should work on as much harmonized rules on the European level. But if we cannot reach that before we do national solutions, let's at least cooperate as neighbors and, uh, and solve these problems together. And of course, there are always winners and losers in this game. I mean, I was a state secretary, uh, a member of this government here, when we debated the uh, big expansion uh, of the European community uh, and uh, actually, I was very happy that countries like Poland and other East European countries joined the European Union. I think it has made us stronger. But there was a debate in this country among the potential losers. Yeah? There were many people here who were so much afraid that cheap uh, uh, Polish uh, labor forces would come over here and take away jobs from Germans and so on. So we always have, whenever we expand markets, we have the fear of potential losers. And but if you look at the European history, Europe has always been two things. It has been a fantastic peace project, and it also has been a project to increase all our economic situation through trade. But of course, trade only works if we have rules 
in Europe. Otherwise, you know, some countries, um, you know, uh, that's not a fair trade if the rules are completely different in one country and another country. And I don't think the electricity market is so completely different. We have the single market where we trade kilowatt hours, but we also have support schemes for the capacity markets and for the renewables, and I think we should try to work on harmonizing on that. And if we can't get it for all 27 members, then maybe for four and five, and at some point down the line for all 27. Okay, thank you. Um, how, much, how much time do we have left? 15 minutes, all right. Okay, so then I would like to open up again the, um, the floor for the uh, auditorium. And you are the first, of course, you have been waiting away. Can I speak German? Yes, of course. Dankeschön. Mein Name ist Reinhard Jungmann. Ich bin Mitglied bei Eurosolar. Und ich habe mal als diplom in der Elektroenergieübertragung gearbeitet. Ich wollte ein Missverständnis aufklären. Herr Barger hat davon gesprochen, dass in der Regierungszeit von Gerd Schröder der Impuls oder der richtige Start zur Energiewende losging. Für mich waren das schon zehn Jahre vorher. Es war keinesfalls die Regierung Schröder und Außenminister Fischer oder keine Minister. Denken Sie mal an den Minister Clement, was der bei der Hessenwahl veranstaltet hat, weshalb die SPD dort durchgefallen ist. So, und es waren nämlich Leute, die in den 90er Jahren äh, politisch aktiv, aktiv waren, die sich auf, ihre eigene, über, auf das eigene Haus eine Solar thermische oder eine Solarfotoanlage gebaut haben und damit bei den Bürgern gut angekommen sind. Wir wollen das, dass, das, dass es ein Einspeisegesetz gibt. Es gab Städte, ich weiß nicht, an die 20, die in Deutschland ein Einspeisegesetz gezahlt haben, also eine Einspeisung gezahlt haben. Aachen war die erste. So. Und jetzt mal auf den äh, polnischen Kollegen, damit Sie das verstehen. Es war nicht die Regierung, es waren die Abgeordneten des Deutschen Bundestages, die einen Gesetzentwurf ausgearbeitet haben, diesen dann selbst beschlossen haben. Und es gab etwa eine, ein Drittel der, der, der Leute aus der CSU, CDU, haben diesem Gesetz zugestimmt, sonst wäre es gar nicht durchgekommen, weil in der SPD selbst auch ein Drittel dagegen waren. So, das zum Ersten. Ja. Schade, dass Hans-Josef Fell nicht hier war, der hätte das äh, auch sofort korrigiert. Äh, das Zweite ist, ähm, Zurzeit läuft in Deutschland eine Umrüstung von über 300.000 Photovoltaikanlagen, die über 30 Kilowatt Peak haben, durch elektronische Steuerungen, die auf vier verschiedene Art und Weisen funktionieren, damit sie also nicht alle zugleich funktionieren und abschalten, wenn die Netzfrequenz 50,2 Hertz übersteigt. So. Das heißt, dass dann Geld verschleudert wird. Ich frage Sie als polnischen Vertreter, Sie haben keine Atomkraftwerke. Mit Atomkraftwerken sollte man auch nicht spielen, die hoch und runter regeln. Sie könnten zum Beispiel in den Sommermonaten drei oder fünf Gigawatt Leistung Strom von Deutschland bekommen, der ja sonst nicht produziert wird, weil er abgeriegelt ist. Und ich denke mal, dass die deutsche dass deutsche Unter also die Energieunternehmen auch dann einen guten Preis machen würden. Das also nur müssten dann in Polen Kohlekraftwerke abgeschaltet werden. So, das das Zweite. Und das Dritte ist das Blackout. Ich möchte Sie darüber informieren. Und Sie können das auch googeln. Können Sie etwas konzentriert? Ja, auf Sie Schluss können gehen. das auch googeln. Unter dem Namen Elect Electric Energy Transmission by Resonance Method. Es gibt die Möglichkeit, überall, also zum Beispiel zwischen den Staaten, eine Leitung zu bauen, die arbeitet auf einer ganz anderen Basis. Und da können hier 50,5 Hertz in Polen sein und bei uns sind 50,1 oder 49 und das funktioniert. Und da gibt es keinen Blackout. Sie können das auch bei dem Professor, der Name ist mir jetzt entfallen, der HTW in Berlin-Schöneweide erfahren, der darüber Kenntnis hat. Und auch der Dr. Amels, der ist von der Windenergie, der arbeitet jetzt bei der Deutschen um Umwelthilfe, heißt das so. der weiß darüber auch Bescheid. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. Noch jemand aus dem Auditorium? Ja, bitteschön. Thank you very much. Joshua Muth from ERIC, that's the European Renewable Energy Council in Brussels. Just one remark and then a question to the entire panel. 
um, the remark to Mr. Varken, just to clarify that the European Commission had done a public consultation on capacity markets and uh, encouraged all stakeholders and countries to, to respond to it. So there is a consultation going on and discussion. And um, probably in June, they will come out with guidance on capacity markets, how they should look like or could look like if they are set up. So there is some initiative going on, and not least then in the frame of the rewriting at the moment of state aid guidelines for the environment, which will be extended to environment and energy, and hence probably then enclose as well capacity markets and support schemes. So I think there is something going on which is not to underestimate and which is as well in the interest of a more coordinated European approach. One uh, question I have to the panel, I, I sensed a bit the agreement on the need for further investments that we are in an economic crisis where we are lacking investments into the energy infrastructure and production, but as well using demand side management and storage. For investors at the moment, the problem is obviously that there is a lack of knowledge about the market volumes which are needed. And what we are having today is a target for in seven years, for 2020. Why should member states use cooperation mechanisms in the Renewables Directive? Why should they join support schemes? Why should they develop commonly infrastructure if there is no knowledge about the market volumes post-2020? So would those countries represented here agree that we need a new binding target for renewables for 2030? Thank you. Thank you very much. That would be, I think, a good uh, question to all of you uh, in the last round, coming to Realpolitik. Uh, the European Commission has uh, announced that uh, they will um, publish the new energy strategy uh, in well, second second part of this uh, year. Uh, so it, there is a very clear uh, opportunity to think about the next step. What do we want the Commission to do or the European Union to do as a next step, knowing that, of course, only limited uh, steps are possible with this uh, this uh, uh, sort of European Union, the European Union of the member states, and we know uh, the, uh, what the crisis is in major uh, part of the member states. So, of course, there are limited uh, opportunity today, but there are opportunities, and I would like to get all of you in, in, in a brainstorming, so to speak, saying, what do we want now for the next strategy round uh, on the European level and that the Commission decides on. What are your major points for that? You know, including targets for whether, whether you, we need targets in, in, for 2030 and these kind of things. What are your uh, most important things? Who wants to? Olaf? Olaf. No, no, no Olaf. Okay, okay. Well, uh, First of all, uh, I don't agree that you always need to have new targets. Sometimes it's good to take a break. That's first thing. And wait for the others, because I don't agree with you. Uh, I know that 27 is, uh, might be a problem, but we were supposed to lead, I mean, Europe was supposed to lead by example. Yes, when it comes, with the, it comes to the entire uh, uh, well, energy policy, the percentage of renewables, and so on and so forth. Now we know that actually we are not leading by example because there are not so many followers in the world. Yes? Now you're actually proposing that we should lead by shrinking. Yes? So now we, because there are not 20 cents, so first there was this global agenda that we should lead by example on a global scale with Doha rounds. Uh, and uh, sorry, Kyoto, and then uh, 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 and then the, the entire uh, uh, climate policy. Now we know it doesn't work, and we start to think just how to get rid of some uh, EU member states who are not fast enough. And I think it's it might be done, of course, but I think politically it seems to me like a incremental suicide for European Union, because 
you need to think about the entire Europe. There are many different mechanisms, including enhanced cooperation, I mean, the entire uh, discourse on, on, on EU reform back from the 90s and to, through the Lisbon, through the Constitutional Treaty to the Lisbon Treaty was that we need enhanced cooperation, yes. Why don't we use those formats? But the idea that we simply, uh, and especially, I mean, I'm not surprised that it's coming from Germany because you advanced, yes, so you have a certain superiority because you made certain steps earlier. And first and secondly, like nuclear plants, you know, like coal, I mean, just now you know, yes, but may I remind you that some countries, including my country, 20 years ago, we were a very different country in a different uh, position. So now we are catching up, but we cannot catch up on any price. And here's my uh, uh, last point. Uh, I think one of the problems that we are having, discussing, uh, not only energy, energy vendor, but also the, the entire uh, European uh, Union uh, and climate policy is, that it seems that it's a transformation for the sake of transformation. It's not about transformation as such. I mean, we should always bear in mind that it's about the competitiveness of our economies. When you are thinking about the free trade area with the United States, yes, and when we know that there is a shale gas boom in the United States. How do you want to compete with American companies in 10, in 20 years if the energy prices in the United States will be much cheaper? Will, I mean, will the industry remain in, in, in Europe or will it use the opportunity to simply delocate and, and go to the United States? I think we need to... Uh, Sometimes not uh, to forget about this, you know, uh, this moral component. Also, the idea that it's better to be to have a green energy than the the other kind, t types of energy, inclu including nuclear plants. But we need to uh, consider the economic consequences, especially these days when we are talking about just Europe, which is in a profound, not only economic but political crisis. And that's my well point. Thank you, Cecilia. Yes, my, my answer will be more or less on the same line. I think it's we can reassure ourselves by setting new targets for 2030, and we can fix in targets for 2040 and 50. But first of all, let's do well what we have decided to do for 2020, and this is not uh, this is not one. We still have to work on that. So I think it's. It's easy to set up political targets, and it's important to have some political will, vision, and so on. Okay, but at the same time, what does it mean? What signals does it send to investors when they know that your first targets are, may not be reached, and where they are not the proper tools to achieve the target? I think it's really the question between the goal and the toolbox you have to achieve your goals. And those must work hand in hand. It's exactly, I think, the, the, the problem you currently have in Germany between the very quick development with renewables but the slow development of networks inside Germany. Because it's 10 years. I know you're trying to, to reduce this delay. It's 10 years to build some networks. In France, it's the same. It, between France and Spain, it took 20 years. And putting uh, photovoltaic uh, wind, windmills, it's much quicker. So there you have a discrepancy between the, the goal you want to achieve and the efficiency of the system you want to, to set up. Because we, we very often uh, talk about such or such mechanism sources of energy, but what we are building is a system and we have to, to have this more systematic approach of what we are building. And this means integrating the competitiveness issue, because I agree, we, the EU is starting a, neg a negotiation with the US on a free trade agreement in competitiveness conditions, which are a bit tricky, let's say, for the EU. So this is the first thing which has to be integrated, and still the second thing is reducing CO2 emissions because we are talking about renewables but we agree that this is a tool 
to reduce CO2 emissions. Wait, but Cecil, what would you suggest for the Commission to do? Well, for the moment, I think that we have mentioned the problem with the tools we had and uh, that the Commission had to had to carefully monitor what was uh, done in the in the countries and maybe sometimes it's good to implement and not to fix new targets and commission also must be uh, an implementation That's force an implementation. yeah okay mm -hmm. i know well of course i agree that uh, decisions have to be implemented and uh, that in my view is no contradiction to long term goals I'm all for this implementation and just a small comment because I know that there are several myths about uh, what is happening here in this country. Uh, I've been working for many years on expanding the grid system. There's no debate over the necessity of doing that, with me at least. But I also would like to point out that as of today, the kilowatt hours that are produced from renewable sources, over 99.9% are being fed into the system. It's less than half a percent that cannot reach the consumers. Less than half a percent. That is not a problem. And I would just like you to take that home because I know that also German newspapers and German politicians talk about all these kilowatt hours that are being produced here and subsidized and don't reach the consumers. Our regulatory agency annually publishes uh, a report and the figures I just mentioned are from this report. We want it to stay that way. That's why we need to expand the system but not because we have a problem today. Second, um, after having said this about implementation, I think that especially in the energy sector, we have long-term investments. The investment cycle is very, very long. It's decades. And I'm not surprised that even after some controversial debate, the association of conventional energy producers in this country now has taken on the position we need long-term goals. I think that is great. We need long-term goals, A, on climate protection, and we need long-term goals also on renewables. Because I think that investors want to have some guidance. What can they expect from Europe? And when I talk about European goals, I'm not talking about goals for an exclusive club. I'm talking about goals that are binding for Europe as a whole, 27 member states as of today. That will be decided on the European level. I don't know whether there's going to be a qualified majority for me uh, for, for this decision, but you asked what I think Europe should do, and I think there should be binding targets for climate, and there should be binding targets also for renewables, at least until 2030, because of the long-term investments on, on this issue. And two additional sentences um, to the comments that were made from the floor, if I'm allowed. Of course, the energy vendor in 2000 did not fall from the sky. There was a long debate in this country over several decades. Uh, remember, you know, the uh, opposition against the uh, first nuclears in, in the 70s and so on. So, of course, it was not the invention of the government. But we never had a majority for these until uh, the election of 1998 and then the government in 2000 passed the legislation for renewable and passed the legislation for phase-out. So uh, there is no contradiction on this issue. And is there another question that has been unanswered that I should say something to, as far as I remember or not? No, I think the other one was just a comment. Okay, then thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone here, and also to the auditorium. That was a down-to-earth discussion. I think a, a good start for a real working session for the next two days or one day, one and a half day, right? Okay, thank you, and uh, have, a, have a good break. <laughs>